want to thank you all for joining us last week for the ultrasound course. We had a great turnout, and I think you guys got a lot out of the course, not only the knowledge about how, in, how to find the structures under ultrasound, but also how to code. I will focus a little more on marketing and coding a, an ultrasound-based regenerative or pain management practice on the next webinar. Speaking of which is on December 6th. It's going to be a little longer and for a little bit more CME credits because I do have a lot of content. There are a lot of items I didn't address in the previous, such as the ganglion impar under ultrasound, but we did cover clunial nerves and a lot of the other uh, soft tissue, peripheral nerves, brachial plexus, femoral, sciatic, IPAC blocks, et cetera. So if you're considering coming to the course, shoot me an email, or even better, Claris is sponsoring a free webinar next week on Wednesday night. I will be talking to Dr. Aaron Franco, who is a emergency, an emergency room physician, and we're going to discuss some interesting pain management cases that I've been treating in my office, as well as show some video, video footage of tibial nerve blocks, plantar fascia injections, genicular nerve blocks. We have some really nice pictures and info for you guys, and it's all free. So just either go to pain exam and you'll see a link on the newsletter as well, or go to the Claris homepage and you'll find a link to the webinar. But I'd love to see you all there and then see you again on December 6th for the Comprehensive Interventional Pain and Regional Anesthesia course. That being said, it's been a real busy time. I also did the Regenerative Medicine course with ASIP last weekend, the same day as my ultrasound course. So I was bouncing between ASIP and myself and then back to ASIP again. So I do have more Regenerative Medicine content that I developed this time, not the spine, it's the upper extremity, where I go over views of the shoulder, elbow, wrist, hand, and I go over the evidence as well as the technique of using a biologic in these regions. This will eventually be available on the pain exam website. It's not ready yet, but just look out for that. Okay, so today, I wanted to discuss this article uh, that is, is recent from April of 2020, and it's an excellent article written by some of the biggest names, uh, starting with Steve Cohen. And you, you have uh, Tim Deere, as well as David Provenzano, and a whole bunch of other big shots. This is called Consensus Practice Guidelines on Interventions for Lumbar Facet Joint Pain from Multi-Specialty International Working Group. And there are a lot of names here, so if I missed you, it doesn't mean you're not a big shot, it just means I just didn't feel like reading 17 names. Okay, so what they did after getting approval from the directors of ASRA, and they did a whole group of questionnaires, modules to the committee. They used a modified Delphi method, which you'll have to look up because I don't know what that is, where the questions were sent to the committee and block and comments were returned in a non blinded fashion to the chair who incorporated the comments and sent out revised versions. They had 17 questions that were selected for guideline development with 100% consensus achieved by the committee on all topics. This is a huge article. I'm not going to get to every little part of it, but it's, it's just very, it's a very important article because you have some of the biggest names in pain management weighing in on some vital questions that we have when it comes to the facet joints, right? The facet joint injections have been a point for controversy in pain management with respect to people paying for them, with respect to indications and how they're done, sedation, no sedation, et cetera. So the facet joint pain ranges from a frequency as low as 4.8% to over 50% in different studies or evaluations. There's huge disparity among how these reports are done, how these, these facet problems are even treated. And there's also a, cor a poor correlation between facet joint pathology on imaging and the lower back pain that results. Lumbar facet injections comprises the second most common procedure in pain management. There's increased utilization with reciprocal costs and all sorts of variations in the way doctors are doing it. So let's get to the questions that they had because I think that's really the most important part of this. So I'm just scrolling here through the article. And I'm going to I'm going to start with the first question because I think you'll get something out of this. This is a big article, so I'm just I'm still scrolling. <laughs> okay, I lost my place for a second. 
Oh, boy. All right. Here we go. I'm almost at question one. Okay. Can history and physical examination be used to identify a painful facet joint or to select people for prognostic blocks? There is a high false positivity rate of uncontrolled facet blocks, and there is an inherent risk as well as costs. So the recommendations from the committee are that there are no pathognomonic physical exam or historical signs that can predictably, that can reliably predict the response to a facet joint injection in mechanical chronic low back pain. Although pain is not predominantly in the midline and possible tenderness over the facets appear to be weakly associated with a positive response to facet joint interventions. Studies have also shown that maneuvers associated with ridiculous signs, pain worse by coughing, pain rating to the below the knee, may be predictive of a negative diagnostic facet block, similar to interventions for chronic knee pain. Greater disease burden and psychiatric comorbidities, of course, may be related to treatment failures. When selecting, tar when selecting targets for blocks, levels should be determined based on clinical presentation, radiological findings when available, tenderness on palpation, performed under fluoroscopy, which I've been doing for a long time, pain referral patterns, and this is grade C evidence. This is low level of evidence, so it's really not here nor there, in my opinion. Um, I mean, I, some patients, they have low back pain in the center, maybe worse with flexion or extension, and it's not the disc, it's not the facet, it may be interspinous ligament inflammation, and I've seen that quite a bit, and I've had to give trigger points into that region. So there could be all sorts of other reasons for pain. All right, moving on. Question two. Is there any correlation between radiological findings and a painful facet joint or radiofrequency ablation outcomes? And should imaging be required before a, a, a confirmatory block or by before, before a prognostic block, I should say? So I'm going to get to the conclusion here because there's a lot of text. Recommendations. There's moderate evidence supporting the use of SPEC for identifying painful lumbar facet joints prior to medial branch blocks. Weak evidence supporting the use of SPECT. SPECT is a nuclear medicine imaging technique that requires IV administration of gamma-emitting radioisotopes and involves considerable radiation exposure compared with conventional x-rays. Doesn't sound like something I would want. Well, they mentioned that SPECT, there's weak evidence supporting the use of SPECT for identifying painful lumbar facet joints prior to IA intraarticular facet joint injections. This is grade D recommendations, low level of certainty. And in terms of cost effectiveness, they need to do more studies. For scintigraphy, scintigraphy, MRI and CT, there is weak, no evidence supporting the use of these imag imaging modalities to identify painful lumbar facet joints or intraarticular facet joints. For, um, regarding cost effectiveness of SPECT, further study is required. For scintigraphy, MRI and CT, there is weak or no evidence supporting the use of these imaging modalities for identifying painful lumbar facet joints prior to medial branch block or intraarticular facet injection. Grade D recommendation, low level of certainty. Question three, should physical therapy and or conservative treatment be a prerequisite before prognostic facet blocks? If so, how long should they be continu continued and should they be concurrent? So they recommend a three month trial of different conservative treatments before facet joint interventions. Conservative treatments they include medications, NSAIDs, anti-inflammatory drugs, antidepressants, physical treatments, heat, cold, massage, et cetera, integrative techni techniques including acupuncture, spinal manipulation if indicated, and of course, weight loss, better sleep hygiene. Although current research does not provide clear answers regarding the optimal timing of facet joint blocks for chronic low back pain or the appropriate duration of conservative care before considering a facet interventions, prospective studies of facet joint innervations have generally required a trial of conservative treatment before study enrollment. They recommend CAT scan or preferably fluoroscopy because of the lower cost, faster time, and less radiation exposure from lumbar medial branch nerve blocks. Although ultrasound may be used for patients whom radio, radiation exposure may be associated with potential harm, such as pregnancy, or in patients without obesity when radiographic or radiological imaging is unavailable. And this is a grade B recommendation, moderate level of certainty. For intraarticular injections, we recommend the use of CAT scanning to enhance accuracy, although fluoroscopy using contrast injection to confirm intraarticular placement can also be considered. You know, I have to say, if it's grade B evidence for the ultrasound, why aren't we getting paid for ultrasound-guided 
for set injections. Now, we are sometimes getting paid. I've gotten paid by a few payers, not many, though. It's still a cheat code. It's still considered experimental, and I think that's BS, to be honest. I think this has been over 10 years now that this is a safe and effective technique, and unfortunately, it's still not widely accepted. Okay, are facet blocks or di diagnostic, prognostic, or both? And their conclusion is that they meet the criteria that the intraarticular facet joint injections meets the criteria for diagnostic interventions for facet mediated pain, but are less predictive than medial branch nerve blocks for response to medial branch RFA. They are characterized by a high failure technique rate, technical rate, as diagnostic medial branch nerve blocks suffer from limitations related to aberrant lumbar facet joint innervation compared with saline controls, both intraarticular and medial branch injections with local anesthetic pr provide better predictive information for medial branch RFA, grade B recommendation, low level of certainty. So this means that could I, I mean, this, kind, this is questions, could I use my facet joint injection with glucopicane as a diagnostic block? And they're saying it's level B. So that seems a little decent, I guess. Are medial branch blocks preferable to intraarticular injections to select patients for RFA? Almost the same idea or a similar idea, not the same thing. But they conclude that medial branch blocks should be the prognostic screening choice, screening test of choice for before lumbar RFA. Intraarticular injections of corticosteroids may be therapeutic for certain populations and when there is suspected inflammatory facetogenic pain and in whom denervation may be relatively contraindicated. In these cases, they may concomitantly serve as a prognostic block. These may include the young athletic person in whom denervation of multifidus and other spinal muscles, the intertransversalis, the longi longissimus intercalis, intercostalis, excuse me, may result in muscle atrophy that can adversely impact their condition, such as a patient with spondylolisthesis or activities of daily living. And of note, not to plug any particular company, well, I just did a webinar for Clarity, uh, for Sprint, excuse me. Uh, we did a talk, I did a talk at the Eastern Pain Association where we mentioned that radiofrequency ablation can lead to multifidus atrophy. Actually, the reference was this article. And such that maybe you want to avoid radiofrequency in some patients and consider neuromodulation, which I've so far been seeing very positive results with. Putting a Peripheral neuromodulator, I've used a sprint device, I've used one of the longer acting um, device companies such as Bioness, and I've had some very good results. And these patients who have uh, defibrillators, there are some case reports here of successfully giving RFA to these patients. And uh, by the way, this is grade C evidence, okay, moderate level of certainty when it comes to doing the medial branch nerve blocks screening for RFA as opposed to the, the intraarticulars. Okay, so what is the effect of sedation on accuracy of diagnostic or prognostic facet joint blocks and medial branch blocks, okay? Unfortunately, I've been in the position where I've done these blocks and once in a while a patient will wake, will, will not wake up, they'll, they'll, they'll report worse pain after the facet injection is needle stick pain, even if I'm using a 25 gauge, three and a half inch needle. So that obviously is something we like to avoid because that kind of screws up the results of your test, just the, 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 the pain caused from the actual, the actual block itself. So they recommend sedation should not be routinely administered for diagnostic or prognostic facet injections in the absence of reasonable ind indications. When it's used, you need to ex educate the patient on the increased risk of falls positive block and the lowest dose of short-acting sedatives should be used. This is grade B evidence, low to moderate. I usually don't sedate, however I do, when the patients are demanding because they're too anxious to tolerate six needle sticks, or they cannot lie on their stomach. A lot of these patients are failed back patients and they can't lie in these positions comfortably. What is the ideal volume for prognostic facet joint blocks? Ooh, very good question. What have you been using? Well, let's see what they say. Okay, lumbar medial branch blocks should be performed with 0.5 milliliters or less to reduce spread to adjacent structures. This is grade C recommendation with low level of certainty. Does that mean if you're doing 0.6, you're okay, or even one? Who knows? Lumbar intraarticular facet joints should be performed with 
a volume of less than 1.5 milliliters to prevent capsular rupture and reduce spread of adjacent structures. Grade C recommendation, low level of certainty. Are intraarticular facet or medial branch blocks with steroids therapeutic? That's a good question. Let's see what they say. They're recommending against the routine use of therapeutic facet joint injections. They acknowledge that the patients who may be at risk of the adverse consequences of RFA or in whom there is a strong likelihood of success. Individuals with obtained prolonged relief from previous diagnostic injections without steroids, it may be reasonable to add steroids to block, to the block in the hope of deriving intermediate term relief. This is grade D, moderate level of certainty. Um, I definitely am doing more medial branch nerve blocks than facet joint injections, and when I have a patient who I think I want to do a facet injection, I am recommending PRP over steroids. I, at this point in time, based on the evidence I've seen and based on clinical experience, I think it's going to give the patient longer relief with need for less repeat shots. It's probably cheaper in the long term. Um, yeah, I wanted to bring something up. I'll bring it up towards the end because I think I have an important point to make, but let's just see what they're saying here. What should be the cutoff? percent relief for designating a block as positive. Is there any benefit in using non-pain score outcome measures? Great question. So in summary, they recommend that over 50% reduction in pain is positive, should be considered positive. They recognize that studies should be performed to determine whether lower cutoffs may prove to be optimal. Although there are studies showing patients with less that with, with less than was le less relief, and they achieved a threshold of 50% um, with RFA. They did get relief even though they had a lower, lower percentage of relief. In the absence of any reliable treatment options for patients who obtain over 50% but less than 80%, the committee opts to maximize access to care in the clinical context. Secondary outcomes such as medication usage, activities during duration of the block, and satisfaction may be considered when deciding whether or not to proceed with RFA. 50% reduction in pain that is attributed to decreased activity, residual sedation, or an increase in analgesic consumption should not be considered a positive block. And this is grade B evidence, so it's a moderate level of certainty. How many prognostic blocks should one perform before RFA? Wow. Let's see how much money they're willing to spend. They recommend a single block. They found moderate evidence that dual blocks results in a su higher subsequent success rate for medial branch RF, but the use of a single block paradigm results in the highest overall number of patients with a positive response to RFA. This has led some, including the committee, to, clinically, to, to a, a clinical compromise of accepting the result of a single medial branch block for identifying denervation candidates with some data suggesting that higher RF treatment response rates occur in those requiring a higher degree of relief with a single block. In an era of personalized medicine, the committee believes that the known variables should be used to tailor to the needs of the individual patients and to the goals of, practice of the practice environment. Grade C recommendation, low to moderate level of certainty. So they just offered med a CMS a way to save money. Let's see if they take it. As far as I know, I don't think so. I think you still need two blocks. I've been, that's how I've been practicing for doing the radio frequencies, but sometimes I do practice, especially patients who've responded in the past to RFA. Is there evidence for larger lesion, lesions to improve outcome measures for radio frequency ablation? How can lesion size be increased? Hmm, let's see. I've, I've heard of all sorts of ways to do this. People add more saline, people add head, head of starch. Don't, I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just saying this is things I've heard and studies that were performed. So. Based on the current limitations of traditional thermal RF and the small size of the target structures, creating larger lesions with reduced lesion variability may increase likelihood of capturing the target structure. If large, larger lesions are used, care should be taken to limit damage to non-targeted non structures, obviously. This is grade C, okay? What, sh uh, sh excuse me, should lecturers be positioned in a certain orientation? If so, what is the orientation? Another good question. So. Near parallel placement of traditional, non-internally cooled, and variations designed to increase lesion side electrodes is recommended to increase likelihood. 
there's grade B evidence. So try to be near parallel placement. L5 uh, dorsal ramus, you don't need to really angle so much because it's kind of resting on that ledge, so it's not really much of a problem. But the others, you may need to tilt your C-arm to get parallel to the nerve. Should sensory and motor stimulation be performed before radiofrequency ablation? I would imagine they're going to say yes. They recommend sensory stimulation when single lesions are anticipated, grade C. When multiple lesions are planned, the evidence of sensory stimulation is inconclusive. Grade 1, moderate level of certainty. So grade 1 means they're very sure it's inconclusive, I guess. <laughs> for motor stimulation, they find it may be beneficial for both safety and effectiveness uh, purposes, and that's grade B. What are the most, complications, or most common complications of facet interventions? How can they be minimized? Okay, so... They recommend checking for, of course, intravascular placement. This should be done in a manner such as a total injectate dose is kept as low as possible to minimate, minimize the effects of local anesthetic dispersion. Grade C recommendation, low level of certainty. The committee also recommends that non-heparin anticoagulants be continued in the perioperative procedure following medial branch, patients undergoing medial branch nerve blocks, radiofrequency ablations, and patients at high risk of thromboembolic complications. Healthcare providers considering discontinuation of anticoagulants should consult with the physician prescribing these medications and discuss the recommendations with the patient prior to making changes. Okay, this is important because I know a lot of pain docs tell me they wouldn't do any facet injection on an anticoagulant, and I do that because I look at it as like this. It's, if it's my parent, I'm worried more about the risk of stroke or heart attack than the risk of bleeding from a facet joint injection because any pain physician should be able to land on that pedicle or the facet joint, whether it's a medial branch block or the, the, the uh, facet joint itself, there are blood vessels there, but they're not major compressive blood vessels, uh, non-compressive blood vessels that cause a neurologic injury as an epidural hematoma would. So I definitely um, think the brain and the heart are more vital than worrying about changing band-aids. Uh, the only problem I ever had with continuing a blood thinner on these patients was I had to change a band-aid a few times. That's it. And I've been doing this for 12, well, since 2007. It's like 13 years now. Okay, so here's um, another uh, question uh, about the complications and minimizing the risk of side effects. Uh, they recommend that patients complaining of adverse effects of RFA, including uh, pain, dysthesia, seizures, numbness, lasting from a few days to a few weeks following lumbar set joint innervation, uh, that the patient informed, that the physician informs them about, about the adverse effects, excuse me. They recommend that the, the, the physician informs the patients about all these effects. Injection of steroids through the cannula after ablation prior to its removal may reduce discomfort following RFA, but I'm not sure if that's uh, best practice. Um, they do recommend that you use the and the anterior, posterior, and the ipsilateral oblique view and true lateral views on the fluoroscope during placement of the RFA cannulas to ensure the tips are outside the neural foramina. Evidence of sensory motor responses in a radicular distribution in response to test stimulation may also reduce probability of injuring the nerve root, of course. Grade B level, level evidence, that makes sense. In terms of RFA denervating muscular structures, they uh, recommend that you inform the patient with discussion about this possibility. Um, it should be explained that there can be changes to the spinal muscles that should not result in an adverse clinical outcome in most patients. However, um, physical therapy regimens aimed at restoring the function to the paraspinal muscles prior to and after RFA may improve outcomes. This is grade C recommendation, low level of evidence. In terms of already previously implanted devices, uh, they recommend health care teams responsible for managing the implanted devices. Neurology, cardiology, pain medicine should be consulted regarding the planned RFA procedure. If the RFA is performed, implanted electrical devices such as neuro neurostimulators should be programmed to an output of zero volts and turned off before the procedure. For pacemakers, defibrillators, the cardiology team, and device manufacturers should be consulted prior to facet joint medial branch RFA. And their recommendations followed. Program to asynchronous mode for pacer, and they should use no little sedation to allow the physician to communicate effectively with the patient and to detect any potential injury to the central nervous system, cardiovascular decompensation, et cetera. That's level C. 
where they, they talk about tissue burn. So the grounding pad should be on the a dry area of the lower extremity with um, uh, area devoid of tattoos or a lot of hair to risk the burn. That's level B. Multiplanar fluoroscopic imaging should be used to ensure the RFA cannula is not in contact with the pedicle screw when the patient has hardware. This can avoid thermal injury of tissue surrounding implanted hardware. This is grade C. Should there be different standards in selecting patients for RFA in clinical trials and clinical pra practice? I don't think so. They believe employing different standards for clinical practice and clinical trials, particularly to those purport to show if efficacy is reasonable. Hmm. The differences reflect different goals for investigators, patients, and physicians. Okay. Specific areas in which criteria may be may differ include patient selection, the RFA technique, lesion size, etc. In which patients should repeat RFA be considered, and what is the likelihood of success? Do repeat diagnostics block um, need to be done? I think that's a great question because I, I see this in my practice. You have a patient who did great with RFA, and then they need another one a year later. Do you need to do diagnostics? They're recommending that patients who experience a minimum of three months of improvement, preferably six, following RFA, given drop-off and success rates, report in some studies and the mean duration of benefit, recommend repeating that procedure no more than two times per year. This is grade B. They do not recommend the routine use of prognostic blocks before repeat RFA in patients who experience a recurrence of their baseline pain. But they recognize that it may be useful when it is unclear if the current pain is the same or is similar to the patient experienced before the uh, RFA. Low level of certainty. Okay, so um, I summarized some of the key points in this consensus. It's a great article. You should all read it. Um, and it appeared in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine. I'll have the link in the show notes. Um, once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for following the podcast. Please review the podcast in iTunes Stitcher as well as if you're a pain exam subscriber. Please review us on the web and um, refer us to your friends. I'm trying to grow the email list so I can keep you guys informed of the latest and greatest in pain management, anesthesiology, regional anesthesia, and even physiatry because there is a lot of overlap between these, between these um, specialties. It's been a crazy year with the pandemic, and um, I finally finished a lot of my um, comprehensive, well, it's never finished because I'm always adding to my comprehensive ultrasound review. I'm currently in talks with Springer about doing some videos and possibly writing even a textbook. So I have a lot going on, and as you can see, I've been doing the webinars and teaching and doing some other consulting for companies who are involved in the pain management space. So I wouldn't be able to do all this without you guys tuning in, and I really appreciate everything. If you ever um, subscribe to my website or come to my courses, you know you can approach me with any questions you may have about your practice and how to code things or how to do things. I don't uh, always have the answers, but I help you, I'll try to help you find them. I like to think outside the box and try new things in a safe and effective way, and the ultrasound definitely has changed the game. It enabled me to do a lot of things that I've never been seen anywhere before, and I just decided to try it because I thought it sounded safe and practical and cost effective. And um, if you're not doing the ultrasound, you should definitely check it out. Um, I did start working with Watmu, who's a great organization, and uh, they have training programs as well. And I just did a cadaver course with them. They have more coming up. You could check that, them out as well. I plan to do a m live model course once things cool down a bit in my office. But for now, I am looking to take on a few select socially distanced group to have a very small course in Manhattan. And if you're interested in coming on a Sunday for a full day ultrasound course, where we'll be very, very careful in terms of social distancing. We'll limit it probably to five people or so. It'll be with a model and uh, one or two ultrasound machines. We'll have a nice time. So just shoot me an email. Let me know if, if it works for you. And if you're interested, I'm trying to gauge the level of interest before I make it happen. And I hope to see you at the free Claris webinar next week as well as on the December 6th ultrasound course. Well, I'll try to give you more than just ultrasound. I'll get into the marketing as well as the coding. Thank you, and good luck.